Some say the trouble's in the Pentagon. Some say the trouble's in the street. Some say the president's a paragon. Where's the trouble at the bottom? Some say the trouble's the anatomy. Some say the trouble's in the head. Some say the trouble's the psychology. Welcome to Human Rights Here Now. I'm Rachel Ann Goodman, and I'm here with Lucia Calderon. We're going to be talking about an important issue to Santa Cruz and Monterey counties, and that is the distance needed around schools when pesticides are applied to the fields. As you may know, many of our schools are situated right next to strawberry or lettuce fields. And for years, parents, principals, even children, advocates have been trying to create a bigger buffer space around these schools to ensure that children, some of the most vulnerable bodies that are still growing, will not be exposed to adverse health effects of pesticides. So we're going to learn today more about what's being done to make those buffers bigger and also the history of this effort. It hasn't always been this way that there were any buffers at all. And of course, as new pesticides got introduced, some of them were more prone to drift. So we're going to learn about that with Lucia Calderon. She is with Safe Ag, Safe Schools, which is an advocacy group mm -hmm. uh, working on this issue. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, thank you for having me. We're also going to have a few call-in guests mm -hmm. um, that will be joining us, a teacher and also somebody with Californians for Pesticide Reform. Mm -hmm. So that will be an interesting dialogue about mm -hmm. um, what is happening and what can happen uh, with children's health. Yes. Children are some of the most vulnerable people because their bodies are still developing. Yes. So what is known about the impacts of pesticides on growing bodies that concerns your group and why is this mm -hmm. an important thing to work on? Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. So most of the pesticides that are applied near schools are really prone to drift and those are called fumigants and fumigants um, are known to be carcinogenic. For example, the most used fumigants are chloropicrin, um, methyl bromide, and 1,3-D or telone um, in Monterey County. Uh, chloropicrin was a World War I nerve gas and is a known carcinogen, as well as a respiratory irritant that is known to cause and exacerbate asthma. Um, 1,3-D or telone is also a known carcinogen as well. Um, there's another class of pesticides applied near schools, and that's called organophosphates. And those are the ones that are associated with um, uh, problems with brain development, normal cerebral development. And so with prenatal exposure to these pesticides, uh, recent science has shown from UC Berkeley Chamaco studies, as well as UC Davis Mind Institute studies, uh, that they, prenatal exposure causes or is linked to autism and lower IQs, as well as childhood exposure is linked to uh, attention problems and ADHD. Which we are seeing a rise of, both of those things, right? Mm -hmm. Teachers throughout uh, South Santa Cruz and all of Monterey County um, consistently talk about how their children seem to have um, developmental delays more than children in other areas that they've seen. So has there been a study showing that schools in direct line of fire, if you would, um, <laughs> if these pesticides are seeing higher rates of some of these pro uh, problems? No, there hasn't been a study like that, but well, there should be. <laughs> it seems like, um, you know, you look at one that is and isn't, and you'd mm -hmm. learn a lot from that. Yeah. Definitely. So um, what are some of the schools you're most concerned about? And mm -hmm. they probably didn't start out having fields right next to them because some of these fields came in after the school. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Um, I'm not really sure. The way that I picture it is that uh, the Salinas Valley is this huge, uh, it has fertile land. It's this rich agricultural region with huge swaths of farmland. And, and the, the communities, the cities are growing. And we see, if you look at Google Maps, for example, you'll see that the schools, there's some in the middle, but they start to dot around the edges of the, of the cities, of the communities, especially Watsonville and Salinas is where I focus on um, specifically. And these schools that are at the edge of the city and the farmland kind of facing that, that direct pesticide exposure is where we're specifically focusing. And there is some irony there because a lot of these children's parents also work in the fields mm -hmm. and came to be field workers. Mm -hmm. um, and they're also getting some exposure and bringing it home. So these kids may be getting exposed twice, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, it's on your clothes. A so-called double dose where wow. at home um, they might be exposed to the pesticides that come home on their parents, on their family members, and then at school um, there are pesticides in the environment as well. 
I'm sure, um, and I'm not going to play so much the devil's advocate because I don't have enough information <laughs> to do that, but I, I have um, talked to lots of farmers and they've talked about how um, strawberries cannot be grown without fumigants very well. They're, they're prone to lots of pests and mm -hmm. there would not be a strawberry or lettuce industry without applying these chemicals. Mm -hmm. that they don't believe it. organics can produce the level of product mm -hmm. they need to just meet their bottom line and make a little bit of money. So it's not a mm -hmm. hugely profitable. It must be profitable enough or they wouldn't be doing it. So mm -hmm. what's the dialogue? I mean, you have a small community group mm -hmm. and a statewide group, and then you have these very large mm -hmm. agribusiness um, entities like mm -hmm. Giant Berry, right, or yeah. Driscoll or yeah. anybody like that. So. How is that conversation? It must be very difficult. Yeah, it is difficult. And at the statewide level, um, we have people helping us that are trying to look at farms and see what farms are using organic practices around schools. How can we talk to those people, communicate with them, see if they can speak out to the communities, to the other growers around them, and let them know that this is possible, that this is a problem having dangerous, poisonous chemicals being applied around schools. So that's one thing that we're doing. Um, the role of the county agricultural commissioners in, oh, looks like we have a call. <laughs> okay, so we have been expecting a call from Karen Wanless, and um, let's bring her on the line. Okay. She's a teacher, and um, hi, Karen. Uh, you're with us here on um, Human Rights Here Now. Thanks for joining us by telephone. Hi, Karen. Thanks for having me. Hello. Hi, so just to catch you up on our conversation, we've been talking about um, schools that are directly near fields, um, and we haven't really talked about buffer zones yet, but um, as a teacher, I wondered if you could just tell us your perspective mm -hmm. on what you hear from parents and students, if you hear any worries and or actual health complaints as a teacher when there has been spraying in the fields near the school where you teach. Yeah, well, one day on um, October 14th at Ohlone Elementary School, we had a ton of nosebleeds. I can't say how many exactly, but quite a few. And we could smell the air, that kind of acrid, pesticide, oniony smell that's been known to be a uh, telone smell. So we definitely know that we're being exposed. Yeah. How, that must have been a really hard moment. How did you feel when you watched all these kids' noses bleeding? I mean, you're there to protect them. It must have been... I don't know what how that's it must it. have been. That's just it. Our primary, you know, our, our first job as teachers is to protect our students. The second is to educate them. We can't protect them. Our hands are tied. DPR needs to do right by these students. What so would that look like, um, Karen, doing right? What, what would your ideal be if they could do what you wanted them to do to protect your students? Right, we want a one mile buffer zone enforced 24 hours, seven days a week. We don't want these dangerous cancer causing fumigants and nerve damaging agents around these little growing bodies of our students. And is that mile buffer zone, is that um, coming from any kind of background in um, studying how far these things drift or is that um, coming from a study um, where you're picking a mile as kind of the, the safety zone? Lucia, could you speak to that? Yeah. Um, in term, so when we talk about pesticide exposure, we, we have acute exposure, which is when people directly uh, feel those symptoms for n nosebleeds, for example. Um, we also have the cro more chronic exposure. And so there are studies that have studied um, acute pesticide poisoning. And there's a study that says 85% of acute pesticide poisonings could, be, could have been avoided if there was a mild buffer zone. Okay. Yeah. So my other question to both of you, mm -hmm. and maybe Karen, you can start first, is um, is there any rule in place now when there's been an application of pesticides near your school that they're supposed to notify your principal and the teachers and the parents? Well, they've started um, on a limited basis. I know that there is going to be maybe next year perhaps a little bit more comprehensive um, notification. Right now, what we get is a few days before they're going to fumigate, we get a notice in our staff room. Um, it doesn't go out to parents. Parents still don't know. There's no notification in English. There's no notification in Spanish. And as teachers, it's really limited as to what we can tell parents. You know, it puts us kind of in a bind. So 
these parents, they, they just don't know. It's criminal. Wow. You mean on the day everybody got nosebleeds, did you say um, there had been a pesticide smell in the air? And did, Were you allowed to share with them the magnitude, or was it just individual parents heard their individual child had a nosebleed? Right. I'm sure parents haven't put, most of them haven't put two and two together. Wow. Because they just know it as their one kid having a nosebleed. They don't know that there was a rash of them that day. Mm -hmm. And so, Lucia, do you think? Sorry, do you think there's uh, should be a law saying they have to notify the parents as well as the school? Yes, I think that oh, that should absolutely. definitely be a part of it. Yes, parents need to know as much as teachers. We try to protect them, but what can we do? You know, we can only stop a nosebleed. Mm -hmm. We can't stop these carcinogens going into their bodies. Mm -hmm. Parents need to know so that they can make decisions for their children's bodies and health. Yeah, it seems like really a, a logical thing. Mm -hmm. um, so many, you know, I remember, you know, as a school child, always bringing home permission slips for every little thing that happened, mm -hmm. including seeing a particular movie. Mm -hmm. So uh, this one seems um, more fundamental than that. It's a, mm -hmm. And we are talking about human rights here. The right to not be poisoned as mm -hmm. a child is a pretty fundamental one. Um, mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, this on um, November 20th is the uh, universal Children's Day declared by the United Nations. Mm -hmm. So um, this mm -hmm. is a perfect topic for that, I think. Yeah, and we actually have global partners um, with Pesticide Action Network Asia Pacific that will be kind of doing a similar uh, campaign, the, the buffer zones around schools and notification for this uh, Child Children Human Rights Day on November 20th. Okay, yeah. so that you're well ahead of things. How do um, you make this case, um, and, and who do you make it to? How are you organizing? Uh, you know, because if it's just some individual conversation between a teacher and a parent, that's a one-on-one. -on -one. But how do you make it bigger than that? I know your group's yeah. helping. How do you bring everybody together and, and move forward? And who are you addressing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we meet um, Safe Ag, Safe Schools, the group. We meet once a month in two different locations. We meet in Watsonville and we meet in Salinas. Um, we're actually trying to expand to South Monterey County and Greenfield. But what we do during these meetings is we, we educate everyone on what has happened in the past month regarding pesticide use um, around schools. And then we have our, OK, what are we going to do? What's our action plans? And mostly what that action looks like is putting pressure on our decision makers. And so what that looks like is uh, writing letters to the Department of Pesticide Regulation and writing letters, putting pressure on our county agricultural commissioners. Um, because of a state preemption law, there's only three bodies in California that can regulate pesticides, that can create rules on pesticides. It's not a democratic community a driven issue. It's um, completely up to the state legislature, the Department of Pesticide Regulation, and um, luckily county agricultural commissioners have an opportunity to um, build upon or create new rules for pesticide use. So we are really um, putting our effort into putting pressure on the county ag commissioners and the Department of Pesticide Regulation. Great, and I want to thank you, Karen, for calling in on the program. Appreciate your time. Thanks for your story. Yeah, thank you, my pleasure. All right, thank you. you have a good day. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. So we're going to watch a video next, yeah. um, and you want to set it up for us? Yeah, great. So this uh, video that we're going to see is a video from um, Safe Ag Safe Schools and three of our members in Salinas just talking about why we need a one-mile buffer zone and, and what their student safety, what their community safety means to them. Okay, thank you. Monterey County is ground zero for the tonnage of these pesticides, ground zero for the number of school children affected, and absolutely the top are Latino. This is from babies who were in nursery schools or pre-kindergarten, through kindergarten, through high schools.
My name is Joshua Ezekiel. I'm an elementary school teacher. I've taught in Monterey County for 30 years. Uh, I work for the Dallas Valley Union School District. We're all exposed. Personally, I live pretty close to the fields and that's where I raised my children. Um, my name is Ana Barrera. I am a teacher at Everett Alvarez High School. I've been teaching in Salinas for over nine years now and uh, Salinas is now my home and I'm raising my, my son here as well. We're fighting right now to create a one mile buffer zone where there will be no pesticides being sprayed by the agricultural industry near our public schools to protect the safety and the health of our local children um, as well as to protect our communities. We need one week's notification by email, by reverse 911 calls, to all the schools saying we're scheduling an application, a field application, on a particular date at this time of day. We know that these substances can have what you call acute toxicity, acute poisoning. That means on the same day that they're used, they make a number of people sick, like happened in 2005 over by Everett Alvarez High. There was a chlorpicrin cloud that moved through a residential neighborhood and it sickened hundreds of people. But what about the long-term low-grade exposures. When you have a chemical that might give one in a thousand people cancer, one in 10,000 being used on field after field near a city of 130,000, and there are cancers in that city, which cancers were caused by nature and which cancers were caused by the chemical? I have a lot of students uh, that um, have struggled with cancer. This year I, I lost another one of my AVID students that died of cancer in Fresno and she was uh, started as a student at Everett Alvarez in Salinas. I have also have two students that were in my AVID programs that they graduated, went on to college and um, they ended up back here within a year after graduating and these were classmen of 2012 um, going through dialysis because both of them have some kind of, of, of illness that is affecting their, their bloodstream we can have a food production system that's safer for everybody. And that's what we want. We appreciate farm workers, we appreciate all the people in the ag industry, but this can be done in a safer way. And that's what we're hoping for. We're back. You know, this struck me, this is really an environmental justice issue. This you could call environmental racism since mm -hmm. most of the people being affected are uh, low income farm workers mm -hmm. from Mexico, Honduras, and other parts south. Mm -hmm. um, they're also people with the least voice mm -hmm. in the state government. A lot yes. of them don't vote because they can't, um, but also they're afraid to stand up. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you get around that political reality and, and how are people flexing their political muscles despite all of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that it's an issue to get around. I think that it's an issue to really use to drive this movement forward. Um, and there was a study that came out in 2014, the Department of Public Health study, and it told us that in California, Latino school children are almost twice as likely as white children to attend these schools with the most heavy um, pesticide use. Monterey County, that number is 3.2 times as much. So especially in Monterey County, this is an issue. And what we're doing is we are trying to make sure that the community is involved in this as well, that they are the ones driving this movement forward. And are they taking roles of leadership in your organization and, and going to lobby and things that tr people traditionally do when they're trying to create change? Mm -hmm. um, at an organizational level, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I imagine these meetings you talked about with parents mm -hmm. get very heated. So how? Do they end? Do people then go write letters, as you said, or do they go meet with their legislators? Mm -hmm. Because you said that it was the Department of Pesticide Regulation where mm -hmm. the levers of this decision to mm -hmm. create a one-mile buffer mm -hmm. lie. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So when does that decision get made? Well, um, in February of 2015, after over a year of pressure from our organization, the Department of Pesticide Regulation said, okay, we're going to make a policy for pesticide use around schools. That was February of 2015. Fast forward a year and a half to September 30th, 2016. Um, they have released a proposed policy 
for pesticide use around schools. As you heard, our campaign is pushing for one mile buffer zones and one week notification. Uh, this proposed policy uh, will call for quarter mile buffer zones around schools for the most hazardous or the most drift prone types of pesticide applications. So that looks like fumigants, um, air blast, things like that, as well as aerial sprays. And um, unfortunately, this quarter mile buffer zone, it will only be from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday during the school year. And so this part-time aspect of it is problematic for us because we know that pesticides, they're not just lasers that, that shoot and disappear. Um, pesticides persist in the environment. This uh, Department of, Pe of Public Health report in 2014 also told us that eight of the 10 pesticides most heavily used in California persist in the environment for more than a week. So this part-time aspect is problematic for us and we're pushing for one mile full-time. So we have um, a new legislator who just got elected, Ana Caballero, who mm -hmm. represents Salinas and mm -hmm. Watsonville. So she would be someone, um, I assume, would be involved with this uh, regulation. Definitely. Or yeah, we, well, we um, try our best to communicate with legislatures, legislators and um, gain their support. Um, Hannah Beth Jackson, a senator, um, she helped us uh, create a um, innovation zone bill which if the buffer zone policy was passed would create incentives, um, financial and technical incentives for farmers to create organic around schools. Unfortunately, that bill um, died in the Senate after intense lobbying from the ag interests. So you have some really big money stacked against you. Mm -hmm. This seems like one of those examples of mm -hmm. David and Goliath fights um, <laughs> that sometimes get won by the people with lots and lots of organizing and lobbying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, what we're hoping to do. You saw the money <laughs> stacked against you. Um, Measure Z is interesting because the whole oil mm -hmm. industry was against it and ran massive ads and it still passed. And that yeah. was the anti-fracking, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which is a totally different issue. But in, in, when it comes to money and passing legislation, it's mm -hmm. just interesting to watch. these. Yeah. Some of these things do succeed, mm -hmm. um, yeah. especially referenda. Has yeah. it ever come to a referendum um, on a ballot instead of legislation <laughs> or regulating um, through the DPR? No. <laughs> <laughs> and um, back in, um, I believe it was 1984, there was a, um, a lawsuit because the county of Mendocino passed an ordinance that um, said there could not be any aerial applications of herbicides. And after that um, ordinance was passed, pesticide industry actually um, pressured the state to to file a lawsuit with with the county of Mendocino for creating this this regulation at the county level. Um, county of Mendocino won but that same year it was written into the food and agriculture code that only the Department of Pesticide Regulation and the state legislature and the county ag commissioners could make decisions about that. So when there was finally um, an ordinance at the county level for pesticide regulation, it quickly got shut down. In other words, they took the power out of the counties and put it back with the state. Yes. Assuming <laughs> that would be the better regulator of yes. pesticides, but it hasn't quite worked out the way <laughs> you want it to so far. Correct. Right. Interesting politics behind this. Mm -hmm. And it kind of goes further back, doesn't it? I mean, this is not a new issue. It's mm -hmm. just been um, changing over time, as you said. Yeah. With each victory, there comes kind of a countermeasure. Mm -hmm. um, we also have Bill Monning in the Senate, who yes. you know has a long history um, with farm labor, so mm -hmm. I imagine, and he's been on the health committee. Mm -hmm. So you have some allies there, yes. I assume, <laughs> that you have met with. Um, what are some next steps that you would like to see? Um, you said that there's some sort of decision moment coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so after September 30th when the Department of Pesticide Regulation released that draft policy, um, they cr there's a public comment period. And that public comment period, it's going to be until December 9th. So we're asking community members, people who, who, ha who feel like they have a position in this issue to write letters to the Department of Pesticide Regulation. So that's one of the things we're doing. The most important thing is that there's going to be a public hearing in Salinas. And this is actually, the fact that there's going to be a public hearing in Salinas is a victory in itself because there was not going to be a public hearing in Salinas mm -hmm. when the regulation was originally proposed. But our community um, pressured different, we, we reached out, we did reach out to legislators that we know are allies. We pressure the Department of Pesticide Regulation to create a public hearing because we are the most impacted community. Monterey County is the county with the highest percentage of students that attend school within a quarter mile of the heaviest pesticide use. That's actually 25%, one in four. So we definitely raised our voice about that. The day that I put on a Facebook event 
uh, for our own public forum that we were going to hold. If they weren't going to hold one for us, we were going to hold our own. The day I posted that event, the Department of Pesticide Regulation released their press release saying there would be a public hearing in Salinas. So that itself is um, a small victory kind of in that long battle. Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. And, you know, government works best when it actually listens to mm -hmm. the majority group of people who are mm -hmm. saying something over and over. And it's, it sounds like there's a chance to be heard and for people to tell their story, mm -hmm. much as you heard Karen Wanless tell about the nosebleeds. I mm -hmm. think those stories, rather mm -hmm. than statistics, uh, move people to understand that we're talking about our most vulnerable you know, youngsters, the future yes. Yes. of our country. And if these people um, are sick by the time they're 16, mm -hmm. not only are they going to be a huge burden on the health care system, but they're not going to live full lives. Mm -hmm. And you know, if we believe health is one of the guarantees mm -hmm. that we are given at least the ability to try to have a healthy life without unknowingly being poisoned as a child where you went to school, it's not like they have a choice whether to go to school or not, right? We have mm -hmm. laws about truancy and people have to go to public school. <laughs> They're legally required to be exposed yeah. to pesticides. Right. There's compulsory <laughs> education, but there is not compulsory <laughs> pesticide exposure. At least that's not what's written into the education code of our Correct. state or our country. So um, that's an interesting one. It's, mm -hmm. it's not like you can just walk off. Yes, exactly. You can walk off your job, but you might lose your job. You can't walk off school. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the, the, te the teachers and the parents would not want to see these kids lose their education because of it. And mm -hmm. they don't have a choice to just simply switch schools. Because mm -hmm. as you say, most of the schools are somewhere near the fields. Mm -hmm. And Correct. they won't take a transfer because mm -hmm. they're afraid of pesticide mm -hmm. exposure. Mm -hmm. So um, do you think changes in agriculture offer some hope as well? I mean, the ag industry, I don't think, wants to be spending oodles of dollars on pesticides and poisoning mm -hmm. our air and water. So. If they felt like they had an alternative or believed in an alternative, they would take it. Do you mm -hmm. see any kinds of innovations on the horizon that may yes. provide some hope? <laughs> yes, and, and a, big, a big driver of this movement is that we do know that there are alternatives, and we know that they're possible. We know that there are farms that use uh, pesticide-free, intensive agriculture, ag agricultural practices, agroecological practices, and are being productive making up to $100,000 an acre, which is more than a lot of conventional farmers are, ma are making on their acreage. So, Right. Swanton Berry Farm is a really interesting example. They're up on the north coast near me, mm -hmm. and um, Jim Cochran is a great advocate mm -hmm. of organic, and you know, he'll tell you, I don't use pesticides, but I'm making lots of money, thank mm -hmm. you, and so are my workers. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they have different methods, and they deal with things by crop rotation. And I don't mm -hmm. know that those are applicable to the very large fields that mm -hmm. we see. I don't know enough about that. But mm -hmm. it would seem that if someone's making more money per mm -hmm. acre using no pesticides, it's worth looking at. I think it may be like many things that people just get um, attached to a, mm -hmm. a feeling that things are more guaranteed, yeah. that there's less risk. And, and they think that by using pesticides, it's lowering the risk of loss. And many of these farmers in, in the big fields will tell you, because I was in a group called Focus Agriculture, where we oh, got yes. to meet with many, many growers around. Um, and the, the one grower I remember who grows strawberries said, mm -hmm. this is not for the faint at heart. You lay millions of dollars out in crop and in investment in the plastic mm -hmm. they use and the fumigants they mm -hmm. use. And then you could lose half your crop anyway. Yeah. So, you know, there's no guarantees in agriculture anyway. Mm -hmm. So there may be that fear that it's so expensive to put in the plants mm -hmm. that they're afraid, you know, to switch. Yeah, and, and we're facing a very complex, multifaceted issue here. And, and yeah. Safe Ag, Safe Schools, our communities, we are not against the growers. They are not the people that we want to be uh, bothering. For us, the issue is that these chemical companies that have been in existence since Rachel Carson's, si Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, such as Dow, um, are overprescribing uh, their product to these farms and, and catching the growers into cycles that they can't get out of. And so the growers themselves often aren't empowered to make that switch. We're hoping to empower them through legislation, through uh, different pressures on our decision makers. So that's where we're going. So the original bill was to have organic farming around the schools. Yes. Um, that's great, because I thought of that a long time ago as mm -hmm. well, that if you had an incentive or a disincentive, like, mm -hmm. you know, you were taxed much higher on the acreage you grew around the schools, then people might switch. Mm -hmm. But people weren't ready to do that one yet. They may be willing to just do a straight buffer, which in some ways would do the same thing, because 
people are probably not going to fallow that land. Mm -hmm. It's too valuable yeah. as a, and productive because mm -hmm. it's that riverbed land of the Salinas River, right, mm -hmm. and the Pajaro River that created the fertile soil that where the strawberries grow so well and mm -hmm. the foggy conditions are great. Mm -hmm. So likely as not, it may have the same effect if it passes of inspiring them to go organic at least around the school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're hoping that with the buffer zone policy, well, we know that with the buffer zone policy, it will really open the door for further um, protections, more um, protective legislation regulations because by admitting that there needs to be a buffer zone around schools, it allows for the problem to, to be addressed. Well, I hear that um, Mark Wellner is on the phone, so let's um, welcome him to the show. Hi, Mark. You're on the program. Hello. Great. Yes, um, this is Mark Wellner with Californians for Pesticide Reform. Hi, I'm Rachel Hi, Goodman, and I'm here with Lucia Calderon. Thank you for joining us. Great. Of course. We were just yes. in the middle of talking about um, a lot of things, the legislation <laughs> and the complexity of the situation being that there's many players. Um, but the uh -huh. main the main power player, I guess, is the Department of Pesticide Regulation. Who exactly are these people? I mean, who's in this department? How do they get in there? Could you tell us a little bit about how they are as regulators? Sure. So the California Department of Pesticide Regulation um, has kind of evolved over time. It, it, it's stationed in the California Environmental Protection Agency, and. Um, because of uh, extra concerns about pesticides in California, uh, the California EPA uh, created the Department of Pesticide Regulation in 1991. So it's been around for uh, quite a while now, like 25 years, and they are they consist of appointed uh, officials like um, Brian Leahy, who is the director of Department of Pesticide Regulation now, and then. Um, a, a, a fairly large staff, and I, I don't know the numbers, unfortunately, offhand, um, that uh, is mostly located in, in Sacramento, but um, they have the uh, legal uh, duty to uh, regulate pesticides and protect the health of Californians uh, all over the state. And can I ask you, uh, who does the testing of, of the concentrations of pesticides in the air and in the water? Is it DPR? So yes, the Department of Pesticide Regulation essentially has sole responsibility and, and authority, actually, over uh, the regulation of pesticides in air, water, and in all places on the ground. Um, and they have uh, six air monitoring centers, uh, test centers, in all the state of California. And two of them are actually nearby Santa Cruz, one right on the border at Ohlone Elementary School. Uh, that's on the north Monterey County side of the border, and then in Salinas at the airport there. And then there are, there are four others that are, are south of, of, our, of our region, um, including one in Oxnard, and then we have a Ribbon and Santa Maria and uh, Shafter and uh, something I'm forgetting, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. And so when the, that information is gathered, how often are the pesticides tested in their concentration? And where does that data go? It goes back to DPR, but does it get disseminated to schools? Because we are talking about trying to give them maximum tools to know what's going on right next to them. And it seems like the information has to go through a long route before it returns to the very people who would need to act accordingly based on if there had been a spike in pesticides right next to them. Yes, it really does. And it takes a long time as well. So. Um, you know, we believe that there are too few uh, air monitoring sites and that they're not placed in the appropriate places. They're not placed in the places where the most pesticides are used, for instance. Um, and uh, they only give, they only study, uh, release studies annually. And for instance, the 2015 air monitoring study just came out, I think it was last week. Oh my goodness. And, so, uh, so it's like, yeah. by the way, two years ago, you were exposed to heavy pesticides. That's not going to help you much. <laughs> it does, and, and that's exactly what happened. Yes. <laughs> a hardly actionable item. So in your ideal world, we talked about the buffer zones earlier, what else could mm. there be as a feedback mechanism? Could you have monitors at every single school so that they know um, when there's been an exposure that was instantaneous? Is there a way to do that? Uh, I, I believe there is a way. Um, the, the, the response is always we don't have those kind of resources in the state. 
And of course, that's always a matter of political will, right? I mean, um, you know, we often come up with incredible amounts of resources, you know, during other kinds of emergencies. And we believe mm -hmm. this is certainly an emergency. It's just one that, you know, we're, we're happy to have programs like yours who are helping to educate the public because so many people don't know, for instance, that um, the that some of these pesticides, for instance, are currently causing um, uh, neurological damage, and we know that measured in IQ loss, uh, that's similar to levels of Flint, Michigan, with lead in the water. And this has been going on for decades and uh, needs to be addressed immediately. And yes, it's it's too late to get information about pesticide air concentrations a year and a half later. Yeah. So. It, you asked what would be our ideal, and that is, well, look, I mean, California's for pesticide reform, um, with whom I work, has been around for 20 years. And in some ways, that's a great sign of our um, resilience and our, our determination. But in other ways, it's like, you know, we would love to go away. We would love to uh, simply be an organization that promotes sustainable agriculture and uh, agroecology and ways of farming that replenish the earth rather than destroying it with jobs that are creative and 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 and, and, and heal the earth rather than continue to, to break it down and and harming workers and their families along the way so it's it's a vision we have we believe it's accomplishable um but with uh, an education campaign and with a uh, political pressure um that i know lucia can tell you about more about uh, what's going on locally um, and I hope she can about Safe Ag Safe Schools because it's one of the most uh, promising campaigns in all of the state. Um, and, uh, you know, under her leadership, it's been fantastic, too. We have been talking about it, and we'll be talking a little more after we hang up. Tell me um, how this um, campaign is supported by your organization and, and maybe some of the other regions other than Monterey and Santa Cruz County where this type of thing is starting to take hold. Yeah, so uh, California's Pesticide Reform is a network of over 200 um, organizations that are, you know, farm worker, labor, environmental, uh, civil rights, and, and health advocate groups. And uh, we currently have three organizing hubs. One, you're, you're talking to one of the leaders of one of them, the Monterey Bay Reed. But we also have um, uh, very strong groups that are uh, led by community organizers in Kern County um, under the Center for uh uh, race, environment, and poverty, um, and in Tulare County at uh, El Quinto Sol de America, at, which is stationed in Lindsay. But, you know, these, um, in the San Joaquin Valley, we have uh, similar, and in some cases with different kinds of pesticides, even worse uh, 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 situations of pesticide poisoning. And, uh, you know, we have continued efforts to push back. In fact, in those two counties is where we got our first county ag commissioners to create buffer zones. They're part-time buffer zones and they're not good enough, but those local fights made it possible for us to push the state to create statewide um, buffer zones to run schools. You know, there's something in the um, regulatory world, what is it called, when you regulate, um, after about four years you end up becoming really chummy with the people you're regulating um, to the point where you're no longer an effective regulator. I wonder if you think that happens in the world of pesticide regulation, because I, you know, we studied this in environmental studies, how people are supposed sure. to be regulating things for the public health, end up sympathizing, empathizing with the people so much that they're regulating that they stop wanting to hold them back at all. Have you seen that much? Well, well we we have extreme fears about, for instance, uh, Dow AgroSciences and coming in with the Department of Pesticide Regulation. I don't know if you have you talked about that yet. No, nope. not too much. Why don't okay, you uh, so, have at it? Because I'm unaware of that chumminess. Yeah. So, uh, well, one example is the pesticide that's uh, among the most frequently used in Santa Cruz and Monterey counties, a pesticide called 1,3-dichloropropene, which is a uh, fumigant, a toxic air contaminant, and a carcinogen. I mean, it is a state-recognized carcinogen, and it's banned in the European Union and has been for a number of years now. Um, that pesticide uh, is manufactured by Dow, and it was banned in the state of California between 1990 and 1995 because we were so concerned about its, 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 its damage <laughs> that it can cause um, to uh, populations and especially to children. And in, uh, Dow was concerned about losing uh, this market, of course, and continued to lobby and push back. And their scientists would send in reports to the Department of Pesticide Regulation. 
and they finally got uh, a reintroduction of 1.3D um, in 1995 uh, under a cap system. That is, Dow redrew the map of California into six by six mile squares and said, you know, our scientists found out that if we apply 90,250 pounds of this stuff in these townships, that that will keep it under the uh, uh, carcin uh, or, uh, the, the cancer risk level. And um, uh, again, uh, DPR, I think, with Roman chumminess, uh, bought the argument. And just a few years later, uh, listened to more arguments from Dow that said, you know, um, in years where we don't use 90,250 pounds, why don't we save, why don't we use it a banking system where those pounds can be saved and used uh, the following year, kind of like cell phone rollover minutes. <laughs> and as unscientific as that might be, believe it or not, and how else could it happen except through chumminess or, you know, the, the power of corporations over a regulatory system, um, uh, we got the banking system, which was only discontinued last year. <laughs> um, and uh, now... Um, the Department of Pesticide Regulation has come up with new rules for this very same stuff, substance. And it's not to ban it or restrict it more, but it's actually to increase what they call the safety cap. Again, this was largely based on science that, uh, if not solely based on science that Dow, AgroSciences, um, gave them. So, yeah, they're, we're really concerned about the chumminess. <laughs> Uh, yeah, chumminess is my, maybe too mild of a word to be using in this yeah. day and age where, you yeah. know, I could get on my soapbox about corporate um, influence over political processes and policy, but I fear we're going to see more of that um, as yeah. the next couple of years yeah. unfold, and it's going to be hugely um, back onto the people to be able to express that they deserve a healthy life, not to be poisoned for some other people's profit. We hear a lot from growers that, you know, we need to feed the world, and this is the only way we're going to feed the seven or eight or nine billion people that we are, is through greater use of chemicals. Um, that this is the paradigm we're still laboring under, and um, people seem to be knowing different from that, but it takes a lot longer for them to have as much clout, as you say, as Dow Chemical, or Monsanto or some of these other mega corporations that um, don't really seem to have the public's benefit at heart. They claim to by feeding us, but um, they are feeding us on one hand and poisoning the children in schools on the other, so it's not exactly a fair trade on both accounts. No. So no, that's my soapbox. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I just no, had to say that. We're, we're completely with you on that, and we need to push back harder more than ever now, especially with the, the new results of the, the president election and what effects that could have on the, on the federal um, regulation or lack of regarding these kind of dangerous toxic chemicals. Well, let's hope uh, California can, again, try to lead the way. I appreciate you calling and, and telling us these things, and I, I wish you both um, the best of luck in your campaign. We're going to go to a video now, and Mark, thank you for calling in. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right, so thank you. And you want to set up this video we're going to hear next, or maybe I'll just play it out. <laughs> Pesticides are a silent killer. We do not see them, but they are there. When they drift, they are affecting us directly. Californians for Pesticide Reform has been an advocate not only for ending the use of these harmful uh, pesticides and fumigants, but also uh, an advocate for the health of children and the health of employees around schools. We are a member of the Californians for Pesticide Reform, which is a diverse statewide coalition of over 190 members and groups working to strengthen the pesticide policies in California to protect the public health and the environment. So we have hundreds of thousands of pounds of highly hazardous pesticides that are applied near hundreds of thousands of California school children. And scientists have linked these pesticides to cancer, damage to the brain, lungs, and reproductive organs. 
It's been three years since we were last promised an adjustment to the buffer zones. It hasn't happened yet. We came on a bus full of Kern County residents to community members from Lamont, Arvin, South Kern, all over Kern County, Delano, Tulare County, Fresno County, Madera County, Merced County, have all gathered today to show uh, that we support each other and that pesticides are harming all of our communities and we need to come together and show Department of Pesticide Regulation that we mean business. I work on the issue of pesticides um, through my work with Physicians for Social Responsibility because we're very concerned about the health impacts of pesticides. Doctors in our organization see people every day that are suffering from the long-term consequences of pesticide exposures. I have two daughters that live about a half a block from a school that is directly adjacent to strawberry fields. There is the possibility of drift uh, into the schools. So this problem to me is personal. I have worked with families who have had frequent miscarriages, children with very serious illnesses, um, and uh, with developmental delays. Cancers are much more common in children who have been exposed to fumigant pesticides. There are some times where they don't even send warnings out that they're spraying. And we can be in school during lunch or during our break, and then you would just see this big old cloud or this weird smell coming. And two of my friends actually almost vomit in the playground. Pesticide reform have been the center of the struggle. Members of the CPR coalition are from all over the state, and they are here today. They're activists. They're much more than name only. They're out on the front line doing everything they can to create a healthier environment for all of us. That I, How could I not support that? We're hoping that we can get bigger protection zones while children are at school playing and learning. Well, I love working with Californians for Pesticide Reform because I think it's one of the most mature um, and emotionally intelligent coalitions I've ever worked with. We need to hear people's voices. We need to speak up. We need to know let, let legislators know that the way we're growing our food now that puts so many thousands of people at risk is just not sustainable, and we want food and fresh vegetables without putting anyone's life at risk. So we want you to join Californians for Pesticide Reform and be part of the solution. Great video, told a lot of the story. I saw a lot of familiar faces that are mm -hmm. also in teachers unions mm -hmm. um, who are also affected. I mean, let's talk about the other casualties of the pesticide spraying mm -hmm. around schools. These people's jobs are to go to school and work every day there, mm -hmm. and also the administrative staff. Mm -hmm. I assume they can speak out publicly and um, protest the spraying near their schools. Are they allowed? Is that? Uh... Yes, luckily the, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District has a really strong union, and they've been extremely supportive. You saw some faces from that union in that video. And Karen Wanless, for example, is part of that union, and so they feel empowered to speak out. And they also feel threatened being at school, um, especially with the science coming out about prenatal exposure, so pregnant teachers as well are, are extremely worried about that. Yeah. So how would you frame this in human rights? Because we all think, you know, it's a human right to be able to... Um, not be harassed and have freedom of speech and these liberties we take for granted. There's mm -hmm. very basic human rights. How, do, um, how does the human rights community view the rights of children not to be poisoned by pesticides and the rights of adults at mm -hmm. their workplace not to be poisoned? Mm -hmm. I wish that it was talked about more within mm -hmm. the community, that's mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, so you think it ought to be um, listed among the human rights? Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and Mark made a good point when he compared the situation to what's happening in Flint, Michigan. I think that the situation deserves just as much attention, definitely. And certainly that got a lot of attention and gets a lot, but you know they have not replaced the pipes, mm -hmm. which is shocking to me. Mm -hmm. 
um, we need to go beyond just mild outrage at any of these and change our laws. <laughs> yeah. Um, because, you know, the, the simple things we think individually we can do, like, mm -hmm. oh, just shop organic, which mm -hmm. I do, mm -hmm. but that's not going to change the buffer zone around the schools. Yeah. You know, it's not that precise. It may bolster the organic industry, but it may not target the ones right next to the school. So mm -hmm. it, it requires very specific protections mm -hmm. around schools. You know, we had um, other things where you couldn't have um, someone who's listed as a sexual predator live anywhere near a school, or you couldn't have firearms sold within a certain mm -hmm. distance. We often protect schools through legislation. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps it could be a national bill that's part of the education bill. Perhaps, and mm -hmm. I think that uh, a big part of it is is gaining that community base, that grassroots base to begin demanding these. And, and we are so lucky to have the statewide coalition of Californians for pesticide reform. And as you saw, all the familiar faces from the Safe Ag Safe Schools group, um, we are trying to locally and at the statewide level really get the word out and just educate the community, let them know that it's happening. And for the people that know that it's happening and are, are fired up about it, having them join us. And so um, another point that I didn't mention earlier is that we're trying to get in the media as much as possible. We're trying to make this a Flint, Michigan. Um, so you can see op-eds from a lot of our community members in the newspapers, letters to the editors, um, getting on those YouTube videos and spreading the word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and as we have seen from things like the Dakota Access Pipeline, mm -hmm. Um, the ma mainstream media hasn't covered that at all, mm -hmm. almost. It's almost been invisible, and the only way you know about it is through YouTube. Mm -hmm. So perhaps um, when you have a good video team mm -hmm. uh, circulating these videos and, and making things that people stand up and pay attention to, mm -hmm. um, you can make your own media or at least have independent media people mm -hmm. covering your story. Yeah. Because um, thankfully there is still an alternative media in this country. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, things like Democracy Now! do a great job of spreading the word about stories like yours and like mm -hmm. ours that are not being particularly covered in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. yeah. So keep trying. It's, yeah, it's, uh, and we're trying to create <laughs> events that draw in that media, even if it's alternate media. And so this public hearing is going to be one of them. And for everyone, that is going to be on December 1st. Um, 2016, 6 p.m., Salina Sports Complex, and anyone who's in Santa Cruz or Monterey County should be there. Mm -hmm. if, if, mm -hmm. if not, to, to talk, just to learn about what the issues are. Right, and so for all the people who are currently struggling with other issues, like mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that the news of the election is frightening a lot of families that are um, immigrant farm worker families. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that in the midst of that suddenly happening and, and making people fearful that this is going to get the attention it deserves given there's other worries now mm -hmm. suddenly have entered the, you know, the story, mm -hmm. um, is that going to change anything for your campaign, do you think? I hope that it can encourage us to stand united in the face of this problem that disproportionately affects communities um, that don't have a voice often. And so I, I really hope that that will encourage us to stand united, to learn about the issue, to, to to support our communities in uh, fighting for better pesticide protections. And let's be clear, the, the schools that are affected by pesticides are not only farm worker family schools. There's people from all walks of life and all kinds of professions that mm -hmm. send their kids to schools that happen to have a strawberry field next to them. Mm -hmm. Several of the people in your video, you know, live, not only send their kids to school near a field, but also live near a field. Mm -hmm. And you know, you might say, well, why did they buy that house? But there's only so many places you can live. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they may have bought it before the field crept up close to the house. Um, there are a few housing complexes in Watsonville I always look at that just went in mm -hmm. smack next to the strawberry fields. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's going to be one of those stories where mm -hmm. there's conflict. Mm -hmm. and I think it will be a conflict as long as there's development butting up against agricultural fields that use poisonous chemicals. Yeah, and it's really the, the nature of the chemicals themselves that are at issue, not the mm -hmm. fact that people are growing right next to, you mm -hmm. know, people have had farms forever, mm -hmm. but pesticides, the, the especially extremely toxic ones, mm -hmm. are fairly recent, mm -hmm. you know, and also hopefully going to be a thing of the past. We may look back on this era <laughs> as the bad old days before we discovered that alternative sure methods so. <laughs> could work. Yeah. I hope so, too. And um, the work you're doing is really inspiring. and. It gives people a lot of hope that um, by advocating and doing the kinds of legislative work and mm -hmm. lobbying that you're doing, um, that there'll be some movement on this issue. Mm -hmm. And I hope you get the sort of feeling of moral outrage that happened at once people realized Flint was literally 
reducing the IQ of people permanently who mm -hmm. were children, innocents, who had no idea it was in their water. Mm -hmm. The difference here is we do know it's in our water and our air and we haven't acted accordingly and, and with the precautionary principle which says until mm -hmm. you know for sure you might as well be on the safe side and mm -hmm. in this case now we know because yes. of the studies you cited. Yeah. So we just have a couple more minutes left. Are there um, things you'd like to tell people that um, they can do um, besides coming to the hearing? Are there other ways they can help your organization yeah. succeed? Yeah, um, I want to invite anyone who, who feels passionate about this issue to come to our meetings. We meet in Watsonville a month, and we have, once a month, and Salinas once a month. And if you can't make it, follow us on Facebook because we have action. We have calls for action. We have information. Um, the best thing to do is spread the word about what's happening. That's what we really need. And we need people to put pressure on their local decision makers, whether or not they have a say in pesticide regulation, um, it is still important that those people are aware of what's going on. Yeah, and most of the people who are elected are elected, you know, by a lot of the people who are parents who mm -hmm. have kids in these schools, so they can contact them directly or help with your help. Mm -hmm. So those are all good ways to get involved. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll be making sure we put up the number and the website, and I assume, you know, if there's students watching that maybe you take interns and people who want to volunteer. For yeah. your organization? I'm actually working with some students at um, CSU Monterey Bay. They're putting on a workshop to get um, as many students as possible informed on the issue and writing letters to the Department of Pesticide Regulation. So there are definitely ways that students can get involved. Great. And mm -hmm. a lot of people go to CSU and be, grew up in the fields or grew mm -hmm. up near the fields. So they're very, you know, this is a very close to home issue. It's mm -hmm. not something abstract that yes. is happening way over there. It's happening right next to us. Mm -hmm. And if you don't live near the fields, you probably work next to the fields. And if you don't work next to them, your kids may go to school right next to them. So yeah. it just um, kind of touches almost anyone that lives in mm -hmm. Paro Valley area or yeah. Monterey County. Yeah, we had a, a college student from CSUMB that um, got her letter to the editor into the Sal both the Salinas California and the Monterey Herald and one of the things that she said was I drive past these fields every day to go to school but I can make the choice to avoid those. The students that go to these schools can't make the choice, may not even know that they're being exposed to these chemicals. And you mentioned the precautionary principle earlier. And what we really feel at the bottom of this issue is why should these students be the guinea pigs for these chemical companies? Very good point. Well, yeah. I want to thank you for being here today and for being yeah, on thank the show. You. Thanks yeah. for your time and it's for all you're great. doing for the kids. It's been great. <laughs> I'm Rachel Ann Goodman with Lucia Calderon, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. Appreciate your viewing. Some say the trouble's in the Pentagon, some say the trouble's in the street, some say the president's a paragon, where's the trouble at the bottom? Some say the trouble's the anatomy, some say the trouble's in the head, some say the trouble's the psychology, where's the trouble at the bottom? Trouble, trouble, where's the trouble? Oh mama, where's the trouble? Got a headache, see it double. Where's the trouble at the bottom? Trouble, trouble, where's the trouble? Oh mama, where's the trouble? Got a headache, see it double. Where's the trouble at the bottom? Some say the trouble's with the principal. Some say the trouble's with the kids. Some say the trouble's the curriculum. Where's the trouble at the bottom? Some say the trouble's in the textbook.